You there? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. We're going to put you up on the screen. There you go. John, hey. Can you see everybody? I can't see a thing, but you know, that doesn't matter. <laughs> I've, I've gone blind before. Uh, I can't, I can't see you, but, uh, let's see here. Oh, I see. Oh, God, I love technology. It is such a great servant. Um, can you hit your video button, jo John? Can you hit your video button again? Yep, here we go. Video's turned on. You know, it's been tough. I, I, I will say that I was really pleased that, that Carrie was also suffering at the hands of technology. <laughs> Can you see me? You know, we, can, we can see a picture of you, John. Oh, you you look as handsome picture? as ever, but it's only a still well, life. No, 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 that's actually an old picture, and I don't look as handsome as ever. But, um. but, but if you could try to find your video button and try hitting it again, we might be actually see your face. Now it's turned on. Video's turned off. Jesus, I hate this stuff. Um. Okay. All right, John, you're going to do this with audio, because we can hear you just yep. fine. Yep. Okay, so look, uh, I am truly sorry I'm not there today. Um, I wanted to be very much, but uh, <laughs> my doctor told me that he thought it was a little too stressful for me to fly. I just had a, a heart procedure about uh, 10 days ago. I don't think he realized how stressful it could be not to fly. <laughs> but when I went to, to make my appearance this morning, I found that Comcast had uh, unfortunately performed a censorious act uh, completely, uh, I'm, I'm sure, having nothing to do with me. But I used, to, I used to say of the war between the nation states and the internet that we had been spared their despotism by their incompetence. And increasingly, I, I think that incompetence is more dangerous than despotism, uh, especially when we are at the mercy of very large institutions, of which Comcast is one, uh, that have no regulatory authority at all over them. I mean, Gigi, Gigi's uh, protestations notwithstanding, uh, there is a great deal that a monopoly that is not really truly regulated can do. And this is what I want to talk about in terms of the battleground that we now have before us in cyberspace and the physical world. I was very heartened uh, to hear uh, two of my heroes on stage this morning, Senator Wyden and Representative Issa. Uh, they, they have been two of the most courageous and useful members of Congress for years. Uh, I'm very sorry not to be there in their presence. But uh, I had to say, as I listened to them, right before my internet connection went down, uh, that uh, there was something very idealistic, I felt, about the idea of a digital bill of rights that could be assured by Congress or any other deliberative body on the planet. Uh, the, the issue here is whether we can have rights that we don't simply seize for ourselves by means of technology and the kinds of regulation that we can, that we can effectively create in the architecture of the internet. This is an old statement. It goes on being more true than ever, especially now that the nation states genuinely feel a sense of threat from the rising nation of the internet. Uh, there are very many people now who really have a sense of their political identity tied up in the, the virtual world. And we are in an awkward position because the nation state seems to be increasingly fibrillating and coming to a, an effective halt, less and less able to protect us from various other institutional interests. At the same time that we are not quite ready to protect ourselves from those interests. And I've been thinking a lot lately about deregulation of digital media. I've been in negotiations with several large telcos who would actually very much like to get away from voice regulation uh, and the expenses and go entirely to an IP network. 
uh, you know that in the back of their mind also is the, is the idea of being an unregulated monopoly, as is functionally the case with internet service in much of the world by private interests. Uh, I mean, this morning, for example, I, I wanted to go to the competition, believe me. There wasn't any. I was going to have to travel quite a ways to get into an area where I knew that I would be free from Comcast's general service outage. And uh, at the same time, the other possible carrier was AT&T, which doesn't provide adequate cell signal in this part of California. So I was at the mercy of two things that could not be made better by public policy, as far as I can tell. And uh, I was also at the mercy of a couple of institutions that continue to believe in the scarcity economy. And this is really important. This is a religious war. I mean, I, I've, I've had this conversation with my worthy adversary, Mr. Sherman, uh, where I suggested to him that maybe it would be a great thing for RIAA and EFF to actually have a study that really found out what the truth was so that we, we could quit you know, using our own figures and our own studies and our own questions. And, and he, he shook his head and he said, I don't think I can do that. And I said, why not? And he said, well, what if you're right? And I said, well, if I'm right, surely you guys would want to know <laughs> so that we could, we could start being constructive and everybody could make more money. And he said, I work for people who would rather go broke than have you be right about this. Now, in fairness, this was quite a few years ago. But I said, this is a religious discussion now. We might as well be arguing about abortion. And that is true across the board. There are very many of these debates that we're now having between institutions of the industrial period and the physical world that are religious disputes over the idea that scarcity equals value and that the best way to increase the institutional value of anything is to make it scarce rather than abundant. There are plenty of figures to produce other results. I mean, Intel without a great deal of competition, demonstrates all the time that there is an abundance economy driven by Moore's law, and that the faster they make their chips, the more chips they will sell. The same would apply to bandwidth. I would swear to you that the same applies to artistic creativity, and, and Mr. Sherman's, uh, Sherman's figures notwithstanding, I am reasonably certain when I say that there are probably more musicians in the world today who are playing music as a percentage of the, the entire musician uh, cohort who are playing music and don't have to have a day job to do it. And it's because they are out from underneath the music industry and they are creating. <laughs> Nevertheless, the music industry or the content industries are still trying to make a thing plentiful scarce with the idea that that will make it more valuable. It's not going to work. So there are, there are a, lot, a lot of things that we, could, we can talk about here, but I, I think one of the things that we have to really come to grips with is that it may well be that government of the United States or, or other political powers is not necessarily in a good position to do us any good, but is an even better position than ever to do us harm with initiatives like ACTA, TTP, TPP, and various other trade agreements that will do in secret what could not be uh, supported in a true open democratic process. It reminds me of the fact that years ago, uh, I went down to talk to Tom Daschle at his request about the internet, this was in 97, and he listened characteristically long and well. And he said, what you're telling me is that we should do nothing. And I said, yeah, that's basically right. And he said, you know how hard it is for us to do nothing? <laughs> I said, well, it looks easy from where I'm sitting. 
He said, no, you know what I mean. Uh, it's very difficult for us to do nothing about something the public feels is important. And he mused for a while, well, why don't you try to come up with ways for us to do something that will look like something, but we actually do nothing. And I wish that were still possible. It isn't possible any longer, and we have to figure out a way to keep the story that has been told to Congress from becoming the story that they can impose on the rest of the world for the, for the purposes of a very small minority of older monopoly interests. Right after the, the vote on SOPA and PIPA, I finally got my old friend Pat Leahy on the phone, who was a little shell-shocked. And he said, well, I mean, first we went back and forth. He said, why, you have my home phone number. Why didn't you call me? And I said, I didn't think it would do any good. And he said, why didn't you think it would do any good? And I said, because every time I talk to you, what happens is that you tell me anecdotes uh, of a sort that you are constantly being fed by people who are paid to be at your elbow. And we don't have enough money on our side to pay somebody to be there telling you stories 24 hours a day. It's not about campaign donations, it's about presence. And the continuous presence of these various forces is becoming truly corrosive and is an enemy of the internet. We continue to be in a pitched battle between the dying nation state and the growing international network of humanity. And every single one of these fronts is heating up. And as I thought might be the case many years ago, blood is actually being shed over these issues, even while the various governments go on mouthing grand truths about freedom and access and the ability of everybody to have the internet as though it were a human right. Our own government does a lot of this, and at the same time, we have WikiLeaks we have a whole range of other things that are like WikiLeaks, where the government is not very happy with an open and free internet. We are at a dividing line, as we have been for a long time, and I've been saying this for 20 years, but I really think that now it's serious. The people of the internet, those folks, they have a political identity here, need to go into those places of government in much larger number, spending much more time to stop them from doing harm to this incredibly important new environment for human thought. They are, they are defending their very sense of what it is to be real and human. And we have to, we have to come up with one that is as competitive in the marketplace of ideas as the one that they are constantly hearing from the lobbyist at their sleeve. I, I hope I've got a few moments to take a few questions. I wish I could see you. I wish I could be there. I wish I could hang out with you. Uh, I'm so sorry that I'm not, but uh, I, would, I would love to have a little bit of a dialogue with you if possible. Thank uh, you so much for your indulgence. Thank you, John. John. I I, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions okay. um, because we had to move the schedule around due to the sure. bad connectivity. But I'm sure that if anybody tweets at you, I'm sure you'll be responding on Twitter. I will. And uh, we'll have you here next year and hopefully maybe taking a victory lap and, you know, getting something passed in Congress that actually supports the open web as opposed to trying to kill it. Yeah. Thank you, John Perry Barlow. Bless you all. Thank you.